Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to, uh, to everyone. Thank you to Burgess Salmon for uh, hosting this evening's event. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Keith Hiscock, uh, and I am the Chief Executive of Hardman & Co. Tonight we've got four companies presenting, usual format, 15 minutes of presentation, followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers. So the first company tonight is Seven Trent. Seven Trent's a, a FTSE company with a market cap of 4.8 billion, very clear focus on water uh, and waste, and a historic dividend yield above 4%. Interesting mission statement, by 2020 to be the most trusted water company delivering an outstanding customer experience, the best value service, and environmental leadership. I think in the slightly unusual political times in which we live, those might prove to be very useful words to have. We're very pleased to have Liv uh, Garfield tonight speaking. She's the CEO of Seven Trent. And before joining Seven Trent, she was the CEO of Openreach, which was uh, responsible for the commercial rollout of fibre broadband across the UK. Liv. Thank you very much. It's like speed dating. I've got 25 minutes to impress that this is the stock you want to go home and buy at the end of this evening. So in which case, I'm going to try and get the clicker to work and see if we can move on. Brilliant. So I thought I'd start just with the fundamentals of why you should think about investing in water stock. And this brings it to life basically for you to read later. The fundamental message is it's a stock that is linked to inflation. It's got a strong history of performance. And I think it's actually a stock that if you think about safety towards it, I think this is something you can feel comforted that we will be needed. In a world of climate change, water is needed. We have a long-term mission that will just be needed uh, for many years to come for consumers. In terms of shareholder returns, we've got a strong track record. And what this slide tries to bring out is effectively you can see the FTSE 100, which is the blue. You can see utilities, which you have had a decent period, and then you can see Seven Trent, which has had an even stronger period. So it brings out that if you are in the room and you have held us for a while, a massive thank you, and I hope you're looking at that feeling good about your selection process. If you're in the room and you didn't choose us, you might be thinking, gosh, I missed it. You did not miss it yet. So the opportunity remains, I suppose, when I talk about the future amps and why now is an interesting time to think about water. That's all this tries to do is to bring out some of those facts around long-term utility and also the fact that utilities aren't the same. People often say to me, but if, as long as I've got some utilities, aren't I covered? And maybe, but actually utilities are quite different. And you can see that, I think, most visually from that graph. So this is one of the things that I talk about quite a bit internally and externally, whether it's to all types of stakeholders, is that your performance counts in utilities. We are judged incredibly harshly by everybody, quite rightly, and we're held up in the spotlight more than ever before. And I think that means that an individual company, you can often end up where maybe the shadow of an entire utility sector can cast quite strongly. I think individually, we've actually had a very strong period of time within Seven Trent, and we're confident of continuing to do well over the coming years. So that means, first of all, consumers want cheap bills. We all do. Everybody wants to know that they're paying a very, very fair value. And seven trends are the lowest bills in the land. That is a natural advantage of us in our relationship with our customers. That is helpful. We've actually already committed to make bills even lower between now and 2025. So we're committed not only to having the lowest bills in the land for the last decade, but actually for the coming years as well. And that, again, is a strong message that we see. But it's not just that. It's about making sure that we work hard to deliver that efficiency so that our customers know that every pound is spent wisely. And we've outperformed this five-year regulatory settlement very strongly to get ourselves in a very good cost base to make sure that when the regulator assessed us, they knew that we had a strong cost base and we would receive what's called fast-track status, which is kind of like, almost like being top of the class, right? It's like being at school and suddenly you're singled out and having commendations galore. That's the equivalent, really, of fast-track status. It doesn't come with mass rewards financially. It comes with time. It comes with a halo effect. And it comes with the opportunity to outperform more going forward. We're also desperately trying to make sure that we deliver for all of our stakeholders. And for customers, they've shared that it is the environment. It absolutely is the everyday things that matter. But also, it's about thought leadership in that environmental space. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, around what we think that looks like, and why we're quite excited to be a bit of a leading company in that space. And then you've got to be there for the long term. And I've put a few facts on here that I think should excite anybody that comes to any presentation is, you know, is this company actually doing the right thing for the climate for the long term? We already self-generate 50% of our energy needs, and we're committed to increasing that. 
We've made some big pledges that I'll talk about a little bit later in my couple of slides. And I think when you look at our capital spend, we need investment in the UK. As a nation, we wanted to have investment. We want to know that there is capital infrastructure investment. Seven Trends just had its largest year in a decade, 769 million pounds invested. And we can see a strong opportunity going forward with a growing RCV base. And the RCV base is actually in many companies decline over the next while. For Seven Trend, we've got a continuing RCV base growth. And that again is important, I believe, to stock value for the future. So when I look at the next AMP, and you might say, okay, so I've missed this five year period, we call these things AMPs, then you know, what's good about the next five years? And I've listed out here some building blocks. And there's never any guarantees about life, but I suppose to some extent, these are the things that we've either already delivered or we've already given confidence and guidance on that show that we think we've got a really good deck of cards for the next five years. It starts with the bottom. So the regulator has given guidance as to how they see dividends should work utilities. And we, are, we pay actually we're well below what the regulator guidance has given regarding this is what a good company should, should provide. And that is the idea of the 5% dividend plus outperformance. We, even with outperformance with our current dividend policy, we're below their recommendations. We're absolutely in that sweet spot of paying the right amount of dividends in line with our performance. In terms of the sustainability of that going forward, We've actually earned ourselves a few building blocks that give ourselves a much stronger deck of cards than, say, five years ago at this exact point. If you do well in water and you outperform on what's called outcome delivery incentives, then you earn extra financials each and every year for your service performance. And we've managed to build up a significant almost war chest of £177 million, which we will take into the next five-year period, which has already been delivered, almost all of that, and effectively that is through hard work and fantastic customer service on the measures that customers told us they cared about most, and that's secured and will now be taken through into AMP7. When you look at the remaining building blocks, we've landed fast track status, that's agreed with the regulator and gives us a little premium. We've got good performance on financing, as you know the sector relies on debt, and in order to do that, you have to make sure that you're compared versus your peers. We've managed to get ourselves to upper quartile on financing, having been bottom quartile just four years ago. We're confident on AMP7 ODIs of continuing our strong focus and momentum and track record on delivery. And we've also had a good track record of really looking after all of those pounds, which delivers you, grinds out total efficiencies. It makes the bills lower for customers of the future. It gets rewarded to investors during the course of the current period as well. Now, of course, you've got to judge us on delivery. And I think it's that track record of delivery that led us to say, actually, we think these blue words are what give us excitement about the coming five years. We've got this momentum in our organization on customer service. We're motivated. We think we've seized the day more than anybody else. If you look at the 177 million pounds that we're carrying forward, that's many, it's more than five times more than the next closest company has earned in this five year period. So we've earned over five times more than the next closest competitor on ODIs in this five-year period, which shows how strong our service performance has been. If we look at Totex, we've saved over 450 million pounds in the last four years in terms of off our operating base. So we understand how to make efficiencies. We don't think we're the perfect article yet. We can still see inefficiencies in our company, and that allows us the opportunity to keep improving over the course of the next few years. On financing, as I mentioned, we've taken our average cost of debt from 5.6% down to 3.9%, which benchmarks well versus the sector of 4.6% being the regulatory set level. On sustainability, we've got a brilliant story that I'm going to major on now in a second in terms of our ESG arena, so I'm going to hold on to that for another second. And then people. So people are your greatest assets. That's true in any business. And we are incredibly motivated. As an organization, if you look at any of the measures, whether it's the engagement measures or whether it's just the sheer desire of our people, they're very strong. And I'm going to end today's presentation with a single slide on people. So let me talk a little bit about our ES journey. So we've done well internally, but we failed to share the facts and the statistics externally. So it's almost like being subconscious within our DNA, but we didn't do a good enough job of actually sharing the reporting. To give you one example, um, if you look at one of the benchmarkings with Stenolytics or the, M um, the UK MSXI data, we'd never actually said the words, there are no fatalities. But that's because it was evident to us that we're talking about honing the well-being of our people, having, you know, we're right at the top end and have been up a quarter for years on health and safety. But because we didn't say the word, no fatalities, in our reporting, it was marking us down. 
So we've had to go through that curve of journey of actually beginning to be much more overt around what we would think of some of the basics to make sure that we're being fair, like for like compared to other organizations across utilities globally. So we've gone through this kind of purpose timeline of almost unconsciously we were doing it. We then chose to actually, our natural purpose desires it, let's gear it up a bit. We then were like, actually, it's not just a desire internally, it's actually what our people want, it's what our customers want for the future, is a more conscious bias through to where we are now, which is that I think we're setting the benchmark and we're now actively trying to announce more to take others on the journey. And to give you an example of one of those things that we have announced, it will be the Carbon Triple Pledge. So only a handful of companies have announced this in the UK. Not utilities, only a handful of UK companies. And the Triple Pledge is a commitment by 2030 to have 100% of your fleet electric vehicles, to have net zero carbon emissions, and to have 100% of your energy effectively be renewable energy. In our case, we'll create, self-generate the vast majority of that through anaerobic digestion. And the remainder that we can't self-generate, we'll actually purchase in a bit of green energy. So the vast majority of that will be self-generated. This is all to be achieved by 2030. And we're very confident of our plan to deliver that. If you think about the nation, we're mulling over a prospect of a 2050 deadline. And even then, many sectors are struggling and many companies are saying they won't achieve that. I think this just gives one sense of our thought leadership in that environmental space and how we're trying to push forward. And then I said I'd end before we go to Q&A, and I'm conscious that you'll have the best questions will come from you guys versus my presentation. So I've deliberately zoomed through my slides to make sure we have good quality Q&A time. But I genuinely believe people are the greatest asset. I think that leadership as, as the chief executive, you can't be everywhere, you can't do everything. But what you can do is you can create the environment where every single person can come in and try and be the very best person they can be every single day. And that's my job. My job, quite simply, is to create the right environment, the right atmosphere, the right vision, the right ambition, and then to support all of my colleagues to then go be absolutely awesome. And that's what I try and strive to do every single day. And some of the examples of where we know that this is beginning to really, really sing, I guess, is first of all, Glassdoor. So actually, we're now a score four company, which is just a handful of companies in the UK get above four on Glassdoor. We're in the top 50 when we were 3.8, so we'll be top 30, I would guess, with a four score. We're in the top 20 in the UK for social mobility. Over 50% of all of our recruits at every level, we deliberately recruit from social mobility cold spots. We're passionate about how you can make a total change to someone's life if you recruit from different parts of the UK. We're top four in Hampton Alexander. That's across all companies in the UK. We have an incredibly diverse workforce in Seven Trent, and I'm not unique, I guess, in terms of being a senior female. Most of our big jobs are done by senior women. We're investing 10 million pounds in a technical training academy one of the only people in the country to believe that actually it's our responsibility to skill up and actually if people then poach our people that's fine large companies should skill up the uk and we're passionate about doing that in our area we believe that every leader needs to be mentally health trained you can't spot the signs in a colleague if you haven't had the training so we're working through a program to get every single one of our leaders properly trained in mental health awareness to support colleagues and catch those issues at the point in time we've been recognized for our leadership on modern slavery and as I mentioned earlier on engagement, we're literally one of the leaders. We're, we're consistently many points above the UK and Ireland average. And of course, if you've got lots of senior women, you've got a pretty low gender pay gap. So that is seven trends in about, what, 11 minutes. That gives us a good chunk of time for Q&A. So you've got to promise not to leave me like a lemon now on stage and all lonely. So I'm hoping that we're going to have some good questions. Oh, brilliant. One at the back straight away. Oh, sorry, I nearly went off process there. Thank you. Um, with regards to the ESG situation, uh, do, do you have a sense of the percentage of your shareholder base that comes from ESG uh, funds or investors? It's, it's a massively growing marketplace, and they're always telling me and others that they can't find anything to put their money into. You know, Amazon is one of the biggest ESG companies in the world, supposedly. Um, and... The second part of the question, if that isn't a big percentage of your shareholder base, do you think it's been affected by the potential change in the uh, political situation in the United Kingdom? So I think there's two things. I recently just finished my global investment investor tour after results. It's perfect timing because I've just seen a huge amount of investors in the last two weeks. Um, there's no doubt that ESG is big in Europe, getting bigger in the UK, um, probably on the journey in Australia and not present in the States. That's my summary of it. If you look at where my share base is held, I've got about 20% in America, uh, about 22% in Australia. I've got probably 
6% in Europe and the remainder in, oh no, and then a few percent, 5% in Qatar and then the remainder in the UK. So is it, there are some shareholders which are purely there and that's typically some of the Europeans. So the Europeans are much more averse. They have dedicated funds and they're just doing it. That is definitely true. So I would say some of my shareholding base in, in Europe, I think is probably dedicated. In the UK, if you look at my index linked funds, where they've got dedicated ESG teams, there's no doubt that's picking up and I'm seeing increased ownership from them as our ESG metrics are improving as we're reporting better. I don't believe my American base is affected by it and I'm not sure some of my long term other UK is. So I think it's a journey. Do I think in two years time, if my ESG story wasn't brilliant, do I think it would have an impact? I categorically think it would have a big impact. You've got to wait for the mic before he gives me the look. I'm sorry. I'm nervous. There we go. You've just um, since I've completed some acquisitions. I'm just wondering, looking forward, what's your what's your prospect for acquisition in the next four to five years, the next AMP, and how would you see that contributing so, to your stock price? So I genuinely believe that um, it's a dangerous situation for companies to believe that growth comes from M&A. So I believe that for me personally and for us as a company, we need to self-generate growth first. You need to look at all of your growth options and decide where's your best growth coming from. And there's no doubt that the best growth for us, like in the last AMP, will come from self-generated management action on outperforming on ODIs, on Totex, and on financing. So that makes acquisitions either there's a strategic element to it or you think there is an opportunistic element to it and that becomes available. So in which case, you would keep your eye, but I think investors in my stock should feel comforted that I'm not suddenly going to do something racy and something international and left field. That's not what investors want from me. My investors want me to be absolutely brilliant, UK-based water company that is shining in my settlement. That's what I'll do first off. They should feel confident that management can deliver and outperform against the regulatory review. And in our sector, you have half the sector does well, um, or I guess makes the base return above, and half doesn't. And then two or three do really well and really push the boundary. That's what I think people should be asking for me first off. We've done two small acquisitions the last couple of years, um, one of which was in energy. And I think our second highest cost base is energy, so it made real sense for us to actually increase and go quicker on, on an acquisition than a self-generated organic growth. And then we made a small acquisition in water where we bought uh, D Valley as was. And the logic behind that is we knew there'd be some synergies and we knew there'd be some growth opportunity, but smallish numbers, we also knew they were good at some measures we weren't good at. And that self-generated growth of your own performance was good. And strategically, we have a good chunk of water comes from Wales. They've got a Welsh license. We liked the idea of securing that relationship ongoing. So I think they're not, you, what you've not seen is a racy period of M&A in the last while. And I think you should expect that I'm focused first of all on outperforming the settlement and doing well for regulatory. Oh, good, the question is just behind you. It's not long for the mic to go. Thank you. You mentioned, obviously, you're going to do a lot of anaerobic energy production. Are you going to do a lot of hydroelectric production as well? And if so, if you generate a surplus, will you sell, uh, sell that back into the grid? So we do sell surplus energy back to the grid every day because we already generate more than we can use in locations that you can't necessarily co-use it in, in both anaerobic digestion and food waste, in um, certainly in a bit of solar as well and a bit of wind. Hydro in the UK isn't big news, right? For certainly my patch. Because the reality is, the, if you're in Germany, the rivers move at a, at a flow with the sheer scale of ice and, and snow that comes down that allows that flow activity to really work. In the UK, that's not the rivers we have. So it's a tiny part. It's 1% of my um, renewable energy is hydro, and it's unlikely to get dramatically bigger. So it's likely to be 1% or 2% is hydro. The big opportunities will come from more in anaerobic digestion and possibly more in some of the areas. But I don't think hydro is a big thing for us. So if Corbyn gets to power and nationalizes me, what am I going to do? So a couple of things, right? So first thing is that if you look at, I think, the feedback over the last couple of years, there has been some fair criticism of the sector. And I think that, you know, certainly I wouldn't ever, ever deny the criticism of the Cayman Islands or the heavily geared non-listed companies. And I think that created a shadow. And I think that the sector has accepted and responded to that very strongly. If you look at a few facts, which I think are useful for the debate, um, two years ago, public sentiment was 87% of the public thought the nationalization was a good idea. That dropped to 44% last year. That dropped to 29% a month ago. So we've seen a dramatic changing in public opinion in the course of that time. Um, second fact we've seen is that we've seen lots of new political parties forming, and nationalization isn't something that they support. 
So in that sense, it's a very different dynamic again than it was a year ago, where we had maybe just two front runners as parties that looked, to be fair, organized and with strong individual leaders at that stage. It feels quite different today, doesn't it? So both parties, or the main parties, clearly have had issues, and you only have to look at the most recent elections in Europe to see that the public is frustrated with our main political parties today. No, no, I'm going to get there. Don't worry. I'm just saying, just facts. I promise I won't avert the question. I never avert the question. So as Nigel knows, and he hangs me on it every time, but I think these are important facts in the debate because you've got to believe, does public opinion support nationalisation? It doesn't. Definitely doesn't anymore. Are, are political parties influenced by it? I think, yes, they are influenced by public opinion. I like to think so. That's their role. And I think that's important. Um, are political parties as strong as they were a year ago? They're not. So I think, again, that has lessened. I think the bookies had um, a Labour win at... Um, 16% last weekend. So you're seeing a, a different sense again in terms of you know that mood. What's our job? Our job is if Labour get into power and if they then hold, an, hold a parliamentary vote, which they've said they would do, remember, it's not just a straight get into power, it's a they would get into power and then hold a parliamentary vote. If they then hold a parliamentary vote, then our job is definitely not to, um, to try and fight against that kind of legislative opinion. Our job then is to make sure that shareholders are fairly valued and that is what you can imagine that we understand. So the first thing is to make sure that political parties understand the success of the sector. And there's no doubt on service standards and consumers that this has been a fantastically successful sector since privatization. It's important that we make sure we work with all political parties to understand their view, because it would require all of them to vote. Every individual MP would have a vote. I think that becomes quite interesting at that stage. And then thereafter, there's a whole host of things. And the best place to look, I think, is Dan Needle from Clifford Chance has written quite a lot about the legal um, situation in terms of the many protections that are available for investors based on that legal situation. And if you haven't got that research, we'd be happy to send along to you. But I think that's a good independent assessment of the legal situation. One last question, Nigel. Oh, he's doing well, he's waiting for the mic. Thank you. An excellent presentation. I'd just like to ask... You have to say that, Nigel, you invited well, it was. It was, in fairness. <laughs> whether you think your 177 million of ODIs is sufficient to prevent a dividend cut during the AMP7 period. And I think around saying your ODI number is rather higher than Thames's. Oh yeah, I think Thames cumulatively are 90 million negative, aren't they? I think is what I read the other day. Um, so yeah, so the good news is you have winners and losers in our sector, and I think that means it's worth thinking about who you, who you buy into. Um, so I can't give dividend guidance until January next year. And the reason for that is because the financial termination isn't settled yet. And so it would be it would be premature and the wrong call. So the financial termination gets set in December and shortly after that in January, we'll be out with dividend guidance. What we can do though is make sure that we look at everything within our power and say, how do we how do we self-generate returns that protect against possible intervention from a regulator? And there's three self-generated baskets. There's one is getting financing out performance to be positive. This time five years ago, we were bottom quarter, we're now top quarter. There is the 177 million that we've talked about in terms of ODIs, and what else could we do? You can imagine we'll be internally trying to push ourselves quite hard this year to see if there's more that we can do. And then, of course, there's also property, um, which is an op we've said quite openly that between five to 15 million pounds a year of property upside will be expected through AMP7. That, again, is something that is quite unique to us. Um, we've got a lot of land because we used to have to spread the, um, the sludge to the land because we didn't have access to a sea to pump the raw sewage to a sea. And now we're making that available for housing to try and help the housing situation. That gives a profit situation. And the last area that people sometimes forget is uh, business services, our non-reg division. And actually, there's 35 million a year PBIT um, in the non-reg area. Literally, just a couple of years ago, that was 10 million. So that's come a long way towards that. So I can't give you future dividend guidance today, but I have tried to give you the building blocks around how that decision was made. Okay, so uh, our second speaker is Rob Davis, who's the Deputy CEO of Calculus Capital. So Calculus Capital are pioneers of the tax-efficient industry, launched the first approved EIS fund back in 1999. They build portfolios of diversified smaller UK growth companies. Really exciting time because they've just launched... Uh, a fund uh, along in association with the British Film Institute uh, investing in creative content. Rob. Um, Madeline is unfortunately ill uh, today. I only stepped up to the plate uh, earlier on this afternoon. As has been said, I'm the Deputy CEO of Calculus Capital. I've been with them for five years. Uh, by background, I'm a recovering investment banker. Uh, I did that for 25 years. And... Um, 
find I'm using the same skill set uh, at calculus as I did in investment banking as an M&A banker, uh, just looking at problems in a different way. And I have to say, it's given me a whole new lease of life. Uh, my primary responsibility within calculus is portfolio management and exits. Um, the fact that we've got someone who's got responsibility for exits uh, within their job title also says quite a lot about uh, uh, calculus and, you know, it's all very well collecting money from investors, but it's you know, much more important to, to give it back to them as well, with a profit, hopefully. Capital is capital. What are we known for? Uh, we are tax-advantaged investors, enterprise investment scheme, and venture capital trusts. Uh, I'm not going to go into um, the detail of, of those tax benefits uh, in this presentation. Uh, they are very attractive. Uh, tax breaks. Uh, just in great summary, uh, if you invest £100 with us uh, uh, for EIS and our performance across a whole portfolio is so spectacularly bad, we lose everything. If you're lucky enough to be a 45% taxpayer, the net, net cost to you is only £38.50. Um, HMRC give you the rest back. Um, it's a spectacularly generous scheme and it's set up for investing in SMEs. Um, what Calculus is known for, we, we developed the first uh, HMRC-approved EIS fund in 1999. Um, as I mentioned, I'm primarily responsible for portfolio management and exits. I have other responsibilities uh, in, across the firm, including organising a 20th anniversary party uh, later this year. Uh, we've got in the bottom right there, you know, multi-award winning. Uh, you know, to my mind, our main credential is uh, that we are just about to launch Fund 20. Private equity firms don't get to launch Fund 20 unless they know what they're doing, you know, irrespective of what awards we might, we might pick up. Um, and exit driven, uh, on the current investment strategy, it's 35 exits with an average return of 1.8 times. Uh, where do we invest? We're growth capital investors. And slightly strangely, the best way of describing this is to, is to explain what we don't describe ourselves as. I've just managed to jump a slide. How did I do that? Uh, no. Um, there we go. Two slides. Uh, we, we are pri a private equity investor. We don't normally describe ourselves as private equity because people then think we do management buyouts, and we don't. Uh, we also don't describe ourselves as venture capital, because then people think we do startup and seed and early stage, and we don't. Uh, what we do is the bit in the middle. Uh, if you're familiar with the concept, we invest in the equity gap. Uh, we're investing one to five million pounds uh, into companies that need, need uh, capital to grow. And what we're really looking for in companies we invest in is those that have not only developed a product they've also got sufficient commercial traction to have a demonstrated product market fit. And we're giving them the capital they then, then need to grow from to an over of, say, a million pounds to 10 million pounds. That, that's what we do. I suspect I'm going to need to speed this up, aren't I? Um, uh, if you look at the sl slide there, um, on the left-hand side, you've got, you know, we're creating a diversified portfolio with a very robust uh, investment process that any private equity firm would recognize. On the DD side, due diligence, uh, you know, as well as the normal legal and, fi uh, and, and financial and, or, and you know, potentially intellectual property due diligence. Other things we do that you might not expect to see is we do commercial due diligence, uh, normally, with, normally externally, um, you know, to make sure there is a proper product market fit. What we don't want to do is invest in a great product that has to create a market. Uh, that's far too much hard work. Uh, and the other piece of interest in DD we do, we actually do due diligence on the management team themselves. Uh, you know, we're very diversified investors across a very broad spread, and, and the only correlation we have between investment, with investment outturn is the quality of the management team. So we spend a, a lot of time looking at them, not only within the context of their company, but just looking at them uh, as individuals and managers. Uh, in the middle, we've got the adding value during the, the investment period. And <clears throat> what I'm really saying is, is where we aim to be is close enough to, to be supportive, but not to suffocate the companies. 
Uh, you know, when we come and see firms of IFAs who source investors for us you know, and trying to get on their panel, one of the things they say, do you turn up to company board meetings? And they've also got a checklist and they're ticking off, you know, attend board meetings. To my mind, it's kind of the wrong question. Uh, for the companies I'm directly responsible for, as aside from over, overarching responsibility for, for the portfolio, uh, I speak to them pretty much once a week. Uh, be it the chairman, chief executive, finance director, head of sales. I'm speaking to one of those people pretty much every week. If something material emerges at a board meeting I don't already know about, I get quite annoyed. Uh, yeah, we're much closer than just turning up for a two-hour board meeting a, a month and going away again. And you can see some of the, you know, the toolkit and the 100-day planning we do to try and support them. Uh, and then, obviously, I don't want to labour this too much just because it's my bag. It, it's the exit strategy. It's something we're thinking about from the outset. Giving money back is important. Um, as a team, uh, that's just the investment team. Uh, someone's done some heroic maths to come up with over 200 uh, years' experience. Uh, and I suspect it's uh, under-egging it, actually, because I'm down as 25 years' experience, and I've, I'm, I'm over 30 now, but anyway. The key point is, if you look at the, the, the top line, um, yeah, these are the people who are leading the investments and are responsible for the investments, and they're all well into their 40s. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of experience behind them. Um, I say they're all well into their 40s, apart from Alexandra on the right, because clearly no one actually knows quite how old Ali is. Um, deal flow and sourcing. Uh, we review 600 investment opportunities a year. They, they come down that funnel. Uh, and we typically invest in slightly over 1% of the opportunities we see. You know, we see some cracking companies, uh, and you know, some of them are quite difficult to, uh, to say no to, but uh, uh, you know, yeah, we have to. Some of them are overpriced, some of them are imaginative business plans, should we say, but there are some, some good ones we end up saying no to as, as well, which is always frustrating. In terms of the... Um, balance the portfolio that comes out at the end. Broadly speaking, a third of the companies are technology, a third of the companies are life sciences, and a third of the companies are everything else. And there's a lot of, lot of variety in the everything else, uh, ranging from quick service restaurants to uh, owning a shipping company. Um, now, let's talk about some real examples of companies we've recently invested in. Uh, Wazoku. Uh, we invest, is our most recent investment. Uh, it is an innovation management soft, uh, software company, and it's really appealing to, to very large companies, uh, and it's putting in place software and a structure such that they can uh, gather all the great ideas from their employees and then manage the process of, turning, of assessing them uh, and turning them into improvements within their business. It, it's a Slightly newish, newish sector, but it's growing very fast, 30% a year. And increasingly, companies are seeing uh, innovation internally as a differentiator. You know, buying innovation externally is very expensive. Internally, it's very cheap. Um, when we invested, they had a turnover of £1.2 million. Pounds. Well, I'm saying they've demonstrated traction. They've got a great customer list. Uh, HSBC, uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Ministry of Defence, uh, and John Lewis. Uh, are amongst their customers, and John Lewis is one, one of their case studies. Uh, they rolled um, Wazoku software out across Waitrose, 350 stores, uh, 60,000 employees. Uh, first year benefits that they accrued from it, they estimated at being three and a half million pounds profits, straight to the, bo straight to the bottom line. It's 15 times their investment in, in the software and the team they created to manage the innovation. Um, very recent investment, we're very hopeful about it. As Accenture Analytics, uh, we invested in in January this year. It is, does behavioral analytics uh, software for fund managers. Uh, and by the bit that's creative about this is it doesn't just analyze past performance and point out to, to portfolio managers where they could have improved their performance. It analyzes the fund manager's past performance uh, and where they had missed opportunities, and then it creates what they call nudges, which will send an email to the fund manager saying, well, in these cases, you, you sold too late, or you sold too early, and it cost you this much, and you should just know that this stock that's currently in your portfolio is trading in the same pattern. You might want to think about it. Um, 
fun, still the portfolio manager's decision what he actually did, does. It's just trying to point out to them how their behavioral biases might be adversely affecting their portfolio. Um, they've done back testing across portfolios, which demonstrate if their nudges are followed every time, the portfolio improvement is 94 basis points. Uh, just under 1% perform performance improvement in the portfolio, which for those of you who are aware of how uh, active fund management works, ignoring Woodford at the moment, but more generally, you know, a 1% change in, in portfolio performance is huge. Um, this company had 1.5 million revenue before when we invested, and also instructive is one of the things that really clinched this as a deal we wanted to invest in is when we were doing our commercial due diligence. And um, Accenture introduced us to five of their customers. And we went along and spoke to five of their customers. Uh, and very, very good feedback. But these were, of course, people who were already bought into behavioral anal analytics software for fund managers, because they were paying for it. Um, we then went on our own back and, and, and found five other fund managers who had never heard of Accenture and weren't using uh, um, portfolio, uh, sorry, behavioral analytics to help them with their portfolios. Um, Three of the five we went to speak to were so interested they asked to be introduced to Accenture, and two of them are now customers. That kind of clinched it for us. It also suggested that as part of the 100-day planning to improve the performance of this company, they needed to uh, sharpen up their, their, their sales penetration because there seemed to be some unmet demand there. I'm very worried about time now. Oxford Biotherapeutics. Um, this is kind of the exception. Uh, I've gone to great lengths saying we're growth investors. You know, you've got to have a product on market, product market fit. Oxford Biotherapeutics is a drug discovery company. In terms of getting revenues from, from paying customers for its products, it's years away. Uh, we'll get milestones, hopefully, from licensing its drug candidates to, to Big Pharma. Uh, the reason we've invest, invested in Oxford Biotherapeutics uh, is it's got not one but two technology platforms which are generating new drug candidates. It's got two drugs already in clinical trials, and it's got a very strong management team. So we view it as, as a very high potential company. I should say it's immuno-oncology, by the way, uh, is, is what it does. Um, very high potential. Drug discovery companies are very risky as well. It, ma it matches the potential. Uh, we feel there's an element of de-risking for it because it's got two, um, it's got two uh, portfolios. Uh, sorry, it's got two technology platforms uh, to generate drugs from, but that kind of thing in a diversified portfolio of eight to ten companies, which each investor gets, that kind of thing has a place in it. We've never put more than one of them in a portfolio like that. And I definitely need to speed up because Jessica at the back, who is with me, has just been, been making, uh, 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 waving, her, waving her arms at me. Another one is, is weeding tech. Um, and this doesn't really fit into the life sciences um, or the technology bucket. This uh, does herbicide-free weed control, uh, which I'm going to do very, very quickly. Effectively, it's targeting municipalities uh, with uh, complete chemical-free weed control. The number of treatments you need a year is about the same as if you use Roundup or glyphosate. Um, and as you can see there, the you know, sales since we invested have quadrupled, uh, which is what we want to see. Slight hiatus in, in, in 2018, but there were reasons for that. I don't have time to. This company is really well positioned, though, um, because of um, the main competitor is glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate, you won't know, Roundup. It's the active ingredient in Roundup, which was Monsanto's biggest product in the world, bar none. And in 2014, the WHO came out and said they think glyphosate is probably carcinogenic. Uh, last year... There was a case uh, against Monsanto for £75 million uh, in California. Um, the cases are just building. There was another one they lost with a headline value of £275 million in, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And there are now more than 8,000 legal cases against Monsanto uh, about their use of glyphosate. If you were running the park, uh, you know, parks and playing fields for a local council, how good would you feel about putting Roundup to control your weeds on them? Um, so that's really the play there. Just as a very quick aside, you, most of you probably, probably know that Bayer bought Monsanto last summer for $63 billion. Uh, and um, with this wall of legal cases emerging against glyphosate, uh, Bayer's share price has now fallen by $63 billion. 
a little over, the, over that, it could go down as one of the most disastrous acquisitions in history. Uh, that's an aside. Moving on, performance and, ex and, and exit strategy. You can see there are three recent exit examples. Um, Horizon Discovery by IPO, Metropolitan Safe Custody. I say the other category can be very varied. Um, Metropolitan Safe Custody is, what is safe deposit boxes, not in Hatton Garden, fortunately. And Human Race, leisure company, which organizes triathlons and 10, 10K runs, um, one IPO. Uh, one sale to financial buyers, one, trade, one to trade buyers, and again, 35 exits with an average return of 1.8 uh, times. Um, looking uh, at our two products, EIS uh, and VCT, um, I think you've all got hard copies of this, um, so um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail. Uh, the differences between the two is, is the investment strategy is the same, we get invested into the same companies, it's a different tax wrapper, uh, and it depends uh, which suits your needs better. Um, EI, the EIS funds are evergreen with four closes a year. Calculus uh, VCT is still open. Uh, it's got an annual dividend target of 4.5% of NAV, uh, which consistently met that, and with special dividends, it's exceeded it. Um, on the EIS side, you know, it's a 20% uh, IRR target per company, broadly speaking, I've done the 1.8 eight times on the realized exits, targeting doubling your money before tax reliefs. Um, given that you get 30% upfront tax relief, doubling your, your money, including that, that 30p back, is almost trebling it. And on the VCT side, uh, if you'd invested uh, when the VCT started, 100, uh, um, 100 pounds, you get your tax relief, which is then 20%. Then, uh, uh, um, you'll have received dividends of £85, so you'll receive, on post-tax basis, more uh, than all of your money back, completely tax-free, no tax on dividends from a VCT, and um, you still own a share uh, with an NAV of £76. So you're, you know, you've, you've made a profit and you still own the share. And very, very quick summary, targeting growth, diversified portfolio, invest in entrepreneurial companies, Growth, in, growth investors with lots of experience and a strong track record. <coughs> my, my feeling is, given how much preparation I did, that didn't go too badly, but you might feel differently, I don't know. Listen, whilst you read and take in this very important information about value of shares going up and down and things, I'll take some questions. And uh, Jessica, do you want to come and join me in case there are any technical questions where I might need a hand? Just, um, obviously, you've got a track record over 20 years or 20 years post your birthday party, um, if you survive that. Um, is, is, how do you source the investments? Do you go out there, locate them yourself, think this is what we're looking for, and then you know, call, or is it all incoming of those 600 companies you looked at, and then you sift through them, or is it a mix of all of the above? Uh, it, it is almost all incoming. <clears throat> and the reason is because we're investing small amounts of money we invest £3 million, we charge a 3% arrangement fee, that gives us a fee of £90,000 uh, to, to pay the bills. Uh, if you are not even a very large but a, a mid-sized private equity firm, you might write, write an equity che check for £300 million, um, and that gives you an arrangement, they still charge a 3% arrangement fee, and which gives them fees of £9 million. Uh, £9 million pays for a lot of proactive research. Ninety thousand pounds doesn't, uh, unfortunately. Do you, still, do you still keep that regardless, right? I still keep what? Regardless if you invest or don't, you still keep the ninety thousand pounds. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. yeah, but it's still much cheaper than the other options. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. But no, my, no, my point is in terms of being proactive on <coughs> sourcing companies. The economics, because it's very small ticket investing, don't support uh, a, a big team doing proactive proactive research. I mean, fortunately, because we've been around for a while, um, we know a lot of people. We've got a name in the market. I mean, we get a lot of referrals from our existing portfolio companies who obviously know people in their sector or their geographic region and, and introduce people uh, if they're happy to make that introduction. Um, uh, you know, we've got a brand. People just turn up on the website, sure. et cetera. They come from all sorts of different places. Um, and, um, you know, also, it's, I mean, it's strange that... Um, 
you know, I spent 25 years in banking. It's, it's, it, it's a bit bizarre how I keep hearing from people I haven't spoken to in 15 years because I think I might invest in something that, sure. that they've got. They appear out of the woodwork. But and but if some you, of it, sorry, on that point, if you've looked at 600 companies, you, you can charge them. I, I do understand the amount of time and effort that's required. You can charge them each. No, 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 no. no, no. Only no. if you invest. No, the, we invest in sort of a portfolio of eight to ten companies, yes. and, and they get charged a 3% arrangement fee on the, on the amount we invest. The, the, the other, whatever it is, 592 companies, it's we assess, the there, there's no, cost, there's no yeah, charge yeah, for them at yeah, all. Yeah, oh, no, God, we wouldn't. I, I thought well, that it was would, quite a good business model. But most it, would, it would have been a bloody marvellous <laughs> business model. <laughs> should, we, should we think about that? I don't know. <laughs> You mentioned several times in your presentation the return of 1.3 times. Is that a net return or a gross return? Is that net of all tax impact or gross? It's, it's 1.8. 1 1.8. 1 and and excluding. Excluding? Excluding tax reliefs. So it is net. Net of, it, net of any <coughs> tax relief. Yeah. No, it's gross. Okay. You give us 100. <coughs> so it basically, that, it's, it that, doesn't include the tax return relief. Yeah, it doesn't yeah so, return so let's, let's be clear, because this can be confusing. If you give us 100, on that statistic, we give you back £180. In the meantime, uh, of your original 100, uh, the Chancellor has given you back 30. So your net cost is 70, but we're taking the 1.8 is calculated off the 100, if that makes sense. And the 80 profit... It's tax-free. It's great. Hello, good evening. Um, you were talking about the, the whole tax setup of the uh, EIS scheme VCTs being uh, organised for SMEs. And I, I know there's quite a wide body of opinion that thinks that the whole, it looks as though you are genuinely following that. Uh, but a, a lot of money in this sector is going for property and other low-risk or quasi-property that they can get away with under the rules. I wondered what your thoughts were on that for the sector as a whole, and secondly, and perhaps more importantly, uh, how you see government policy going in this sector, because I, I think there was a lot of um, thought that the, some of the tax benefits might go last time, and they didn't, and I, I wondered how you looked at that going forward in terms of the tax incentives being, being kept. I think, I think the change has already occurred. Yeah. Two, two Novembers ago. I mean, there was... Um, Listen, effectively, it's a government tax incentive uh, to invest in SMEs, and the government ad, uh, are doing that because there's a huge amount of economic evidence that investing S in SMEs grows the UK economy. And investing in FTSE 100 companies doesn't, frankly. Uh, it's worth noting almost every country in Europe uh, has some form of governmental incentive to invest in SMEs for exactly the same reason. Um, within... You know, Calculus Capital has always been a growth investor in entrepreneurial companies. Uh, you're absolutely right that, that um, there have been others who are looking at the tax benefits um, and then working, way, working out ways to deliver those tax benefits to their investors with the lowest possible risk. And an example was renewable energy, solar, uh, where effectively you could get EIS tax relief in order to build a solar farm which had government guaranteed revenues for the next 25 years. So you know, revenue, revenue turned around and said, well, come on, guys, you're kind of double dipping on our generosity here. And so they shut that off about four years ago. Uh, and then two Novembers ago, um, they cut off some of the other abuses where, where people were investing in limited life companies which had guaranteed revenues because they'd already pre-sold the rights. Um, to what they, were, what they were going to develop and there, were, and there was very little, if any, risk. Uh, and at which point uh, the Treasury sort of turned around and said, and this direct quote from someone at the Treasury said, listen, guys, we've had enough of playing whack-a-mole. You're all very smart and yeah, we should give you a set of rules uh, and you keep coming up, come pushing the envelope and finding a way, way to you know, not deliver our policy objective. Uh, and so they introduced what's called a growth and development test and said up front, yeah, we know this is tax legislation, uh, and so everything should be completely objective. But this is a subjective test. You have to convince HBRC this is a genuine you know, you know, entrepreneurial company that's going to grow. Uh, and if you can't convince HMRC, you're not getting EIS benefit. 
Uh, and that's it, because we're just not paying whack-a-mole anymore. Thank you very much. And, oh, do we have time for one? Just, just one very quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, you haven't mentioned any write-offs. I've got VCTs, and uh, you do get a number of duds. How does that, how's your record on that? Uh, broadly speaking, um, with, uh, it depends where you're investing. You know, if you're a, a VC investor, which we're not, effectively 80% of your company is going to be zeros, and you get your portfolio return from the other 20%. Uh, if you're a big buyout house, um, you expect very few zeros and returns from most of the portfolio. With us, we sit in the middle. It's about a third uh, will be loss-making investments. About a third will do okay. Make, say, your money back to 50% profit. And all of the portfolio return comes from the remaining third. Um, the important thing about the 1.8 times, that's an average, it includes the zeros. And there are zeros and loss-making investments in it. We, that's not... We've had 35 profitable exits, which came to 1.8 times. It includes, is it, is it 14 loss-making? 30, 30, that, that 35 includes uh, 13 loss-making investments, and it still comes out on average at the 1.8. I will be around afterwards to answer any questions, and if it gets too technical, please find Jessica. Yeah? Thank you very much for that. Clearly, uh, the lesson is that uh, whenever you go to a presentation again, only read the slides on the five stops uh, to the meeting. Um, right, third company, Volta Finance. This is a uh, quoted investment company specialising in a broad portfolio of structured finance assets, maintains uh, the flexibility to optimise long-term returns in highly dynamic markets. Uh, it's generated 12.9% per annum shareholder return in the last five years. But importantly, that's from predictable coupons and dividends and not from capital gains. Deep market understanding, able to identify uh, assets which are mispriced for risk. We're very fortunate to have Serge Demay here, who's the head of CLO Investments at AXA, which is the manager of the fund. Serge. So thank you, thank you for, for, for being there. Uh, yeah, sorry. So Volta Finance, it exists for uh, 12 years now, almost 12 years and a half. As Keith mentioned, we are investing in, uh, in structural finance assets. So what other people name alternative credit. So it's totally different from what, what you hear for the, for, for, for the past two presentations. So our job is to invest in basically a credit market through structuring investment. And as Keith mentioned, to perform in the area of between 10 and 12 percent, it is what we aim to uh, achieve in terms of performance. And we are doing that for the last 12 years. So Volta is managed by uh, AXA IM Structural Finance Department. Uh, I'm part of this department. It's a department which invests in alternative credit for the last uh, 20 years. So we are uh, one of the longest and most experienced people investing in structural finance in Europe for the last 20 years. In terms of asset under management, we manage 40 billion euro in structural finance, which makes us the largest investor and the most experienced investor in Europe uh, in this asset class. So the, here you have uh, an idea of the performance. So of course, Volta suffered a lot during the 2008 and 9 crisis, as you can imagine, because everybody was confusing everything. So our investment at the end performed very well, but the mark to market was very difficult in years 2008 as people confused uh, subprime assets with uh, every structural finance investment. So we, we were totally absent and outside of, uh, of subprime and, and US RMBS, but we suffered a lot in terms of volatility. But at the end, the performance was, was there. Uh, for the last five years, you mentioned 12%. It was two months ago. Now we are, we, 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 we are a bit away from the very good performance of 2014 and 15. So we are only at 10.2% for the last five years, but still on track with uh, what we target, a performance in the area of 10 to, to 12% every year. And you can see that there is not a lot of volatility. Uh, here we compare Volta with, uh, let's say, more classic investment, because for you, you are you're probably much more familiar with investment in classic equity market or, or classic credit market. So we, if we compare Volta on one year, three years, five years, or since the inception of Volta to classic credit market, 
you, see, you can see that our performance, the, the performance of the share price, so the, the, the share in which you can invest, performed close to 10% since inception, so 12 years ago. We are, ba we are basically at the same level by, than the S&P, but we are in Europe, so you, you can compare that to uh, the MSCI Europe, which is 3%, so we are far above that. And if you look at the last one year or three years, only the S&P is doing a better performance than us, and probably thanks to the, the cyclical boost of Trump for the last two or three years. So we'll see how it will end up. But uh, we, we, we are very well performing relative to, let's say, classic investment. And it is really the, the aim of Volta to benefit from uh, the, all the premium that exists in structural finance, You all remember that the last big crisis was uh, the subprime, so it was structural finance. And since this crisis, every investment in structural finance benefits from a premium in terms of uh, stigma, in terms of illiquidity, in terms of complexity. So thanks to that, all the investments we can make are still benefiting from an excess remuneration relative to the risk. And it's thanks to this premium that we are able to perform above 10% for the, la for the last years. Uh, here we compare, and it is really what people are doing, they generally compare Volta to some of our competitors, so uh, probably some of you are, uh, already heard about Carador or Ferox or, or BGLF, which are very the, the competitor of Volta. I'm not going to talk about our competitors, but just to mention that in terms of sharp ratio, so here there is the sharp ratio on three years and the sharp ratio on five years basis, And we have a better sharp ratio than all of our competitors. And it is also part of our uh, DNA as an investor. We are looking for building a portfolio which is able to uh, resist in terms of volatility, to be uh, relatively diversified in terms of risk. So I will just give you one, one figure. When you look at all the underlying assets to which we are exposed when we, we are managing Volta portfolio, there is more than 700 Uh, different credit inside the portfolio. So that's fantastically diversified. There is no way when you invest into Volta that you are going to suffer because there is one default or two default or five default, whatever of these default. Uh, your exposure is really a systemic risk to the overall macroeconomy. So your, your risk when you invest in Volta is that tomorrow there is a big economic downturn. Your risk is not that uh, a company default. So the, the portfolio is fantastically diversified. And our job doing structural finance is to uh, capture premium when there is premium and at the end being, being exposed to the systemic risk that exists almost everywhere. And, and just in terms of sharp ratio, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of sharp ratio. Classic sharp ratio for investment in equity are 0.5, 0.6. Here for Volta, we are close to 2%. We are 1.7 or 1.8%. Oh, the sharp ratio is just the ratio between the performance and the volatility. So basically, for the last years, we had performances in the area of, let's say, 10%, a bit, a bit north than 10%, and the volatility was in the area of 5%, 5% to 6%. So we basically performed twice the level of the volatility. So if you look at classic equity market, volatility is going, is going to be 15%, and the expected performance on equity is 6% or 7% a year. So that's a sharp ratio of 0.5, 0.6. The second thing for Volta is that we invest in only in assets which are performing assets. We are not specialized in distressed vehicles. We are investing in performing assets. And the result of that is that the dividend cover is very, very high. So Volta is a company that provides a very large dividend. Our dividend rate here is on, on six months basis is uh, our annual basis on, 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 the, on, the, on, on the left. You can see that the dividend is relative to the NAV, it's between 8 and 7%, relative to the share price, because the share price is at the moment at 15% discount to the NAV, so it's, that's a discount for you in terms of investing in Volta. We are at between 9 and 10% dividend every year. And the, the dividend is covered by uh, interest and coupons that we receive from our assets because we, are, we invest in performing assets. And the dividend cover is between 1.4 and 1.8% for the last 5, 6, 7 years, or even 8 years. So Volta is paying a very high dividend, 9 to 10% every year relative to the share price, and it is highly covered by the 
ongoing cash flow that we receive from our assets. So there is no issue for us paying this kind of dividend for the coming years. In, in terms of uh, where we are, uh, in terms of macroeconomics, because as I said, the, the main risk is the macroeconomic risk. To us, it's very clear that we are at the end of the credit cycle. You know, I'm sure for the one which invests in credit that you notice that spread was tighter one year ago. There has been a bit of volatility last year. It's, it's better this year, but again, at some point, there will be some volatility again. So for us, that's very clear that we are at the end of the credit cycle. We have seen the tightest level one year or 18 months ago. We are going to see more volatility going forward. And we think we are also basically at the end of the economic cycles after 10 years of growth in the US, same thing in, in, in UK. When you look at unemployment rate, we are at the lowest level in UK, in US, in Germany. So there is a lot of signs telling us that we are at the end of the economic cycle. Despite that, we, and to be, to be transparent and honest, we are, we are not seeing any sign of an imminent or brutal downturn. So our view is that probably this year, next year, the year after, we are going to live in a probably a sideways economics. Uh, with growth being between zero and one or two percent, depending in e of the area, we are not expecting anything brutal. And this kind of environment is could be a good environment for for equity market, but definitely is a good environment for credit market, because the economy, even though the economy is not fantastically robust, there is a bit of e of growth, and that's good to just repay the debt. So we don't expect uh, any significant increase in default in credit market. We expect to see and to continue having some default from time to time as, you, as we have and nowadays, but we don't expect anything very brutal. And this kind of environment is pretty supportive for credit because it means that uh, central banks are going to stop increasing rate. It is already the case in the US. So interest rates are going to stay low. So that's, that's supportive for the credit in general. Uh, so an example of that is when you look at uh, the the, don't, uh, the downgrade to upgrade uh, history of, of credit in the US. Uh, for example, last year, there has been in the US almost twice more upgrades by rating agencies than downgrades. So that, that's still very supportive in terms of what is the view on credit market here, at least from uh, rating agencies. Uh, in Volta, we, we are, as I said, we invest in structural finance and most of our investments, so 95% of our investments are on corporate credits, so on, corp on corporate loans. So I'm sure you, most of you read some press on, on the loan market saying that the loans are covenant light relative to what they were uh, five or six years ago. And that's true that the quality of loans nowadays is probably not as good as it was uh, five or six years ago. So there is a kind of uh, lower quality in the loan market. But this lower quality should also be seen from the point of view of the company because having no covenant on the loans means that the company is much more able to go through some cycle, some d d difficult cycle without being in default. So when we look at the current situation, probably uh, for the same economic situation, it means that we are going to have lower default rates. But when there is a default, because the, the default will occur far later in the cycle of deterioration of the economy, uh, the, the recovery will be lower. But if we have, as we think, less default but lower recovery, probably at the end the expected losses are the same. And it is what we think. We think that the current situation is not very different from the situation we have lived with for the last 10 or 15 years or 20 years. So we are, we are not seeing any significant change in the, the, the situation for our uh, investments. And probably a word on that to say that, the, coming back to the economic situation, as I said, we, we think we are near the end of the credit cycles. And something which is very important to notice is that most of our investments in Volta are in CLOs and CLO equity. And when we look at the track record of investment in CLO by uh, year of issuance of those CLOs, just one thing to, 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 to look at is the performance of the vintages 2006 and 2007. It, it has been the best vintages for CLO equity. So the CLO equity issued just before the great financial crisis has been the one performing the best. 
So it could be a bit bizarre and be, being a bit esoteric, but the reality of that is due to the fact that CL equity are vehicles which are reinvesting. So those vehicles that were set up just before the crisis benefited a lot from the reinvestment opportunities that were in 8, 9, 10, 11, so during the crisis and after the crisis. And so I'm not telling you that we are going to have such a kind of crisis in the coming years, but we expect more volatility in the coming years, and we expect our portfolio to benefit tomorrow from the volatility that could happen in credit market. So that it is exactly our investment thesis at the moment to invest in assets that have uh, what we name a, a positive optionality to volatility. So meaning that if tomorrow in credit market there is more volatility, we will benefit from this volatility. And it is what we are, we are looking for at the moment. And here, just to mention it, you have our track record at AXRIM in terms of investment in these assets. And you can, you can see that every vintage is we perform two, three, five, seven points above the, the market average. So we are also good in selecting the assets we are investing in. A very simple example, and probably I will, I will, I will stop with, with that, in terms of what we are doing. Our job, basically, because I'm not going here to enter into a, every detail of the type of investment in which we are, we are investing, but our business is basically to invest in assets which are yielding between 8 and 20%, 8 to 15% more of the investment we are, we are doing. And because those investments are good investments, after two, three, four years, we are able to sell, to sell those positions at a lower yield, so at a higher price. And basically our job is to invest in assets yielding 8 to 15%, selling part of it at a yield around 5%, and generating a gain from that on top of the ongoing performance of these assets. So when I look at uh, the current portfolio of Volta at the moment, Volta portfolio is yielding 11%, 11.5% at the moment. So we have a portfolio which is really on track with, who, with what we have delivered for the last 5, 10 years. So still able to perform 10 to, to 11%. And there is some good chance if we, are, we continue to be able to rotate the portfolio and to trade the portfolio to generate extra gains on top of this, let's say, 11.5% yield. So that's really what we, we want to do. Uh, yeah, and that's all. So I can open the floor for, for questions. Can I ask a question? You mentioned the uh, the uh, shares in the fund and the trust are trading at a 15% discount to NAV. Is that something that you, the board, want to do something about or do you just let the market look after itself? Of course, as a company, we, we are looking to narrow the discount. So uh, it's a, it's, it, the, the board of Volta, because the Volta is a listed vehicle with a, with a board, the board decided to hire our, our man to, to help us marketing Volta. We are also doing that with, with Edison. I'm regularly in London or uh, else, uh, uh, some, some other places to market Volta to shareholders. So yes, we are, we are doing a, a, a bit more effort to narrow this gap. The, 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 the discount was uh, 20% uh, six months ago. Now we are at 15%. I can't assure that we are going to be successful, but at least we are, we are doing things to narrow this discount. The, the, the mix of your portfolio uh, with regards, so I'm just trying to understand um, if we get into a situation where you're a forced seller of an asset, um, do you hold things, what percentage of your portfolio could you hold to maturity and at least you know you're getting your money back? Do you understand that? It, it, and thereby we know that if it's yielding X at the minute, we'll get that number and it's going to be okay. Or could you get a situation where there's forced sellers all over the marketplace and you simply can't get out? And I do recognize that a bad market gives you opportunity. The, the first thing to mention is that in, in Volta, we have almost no leverage. The, the only leverage that we have is that part of our investments, so CLO debt, are leveraged for a repo. But this repo is limited to $40 million. So it is 12% of Volta. And this 12% of Volta is less than the ongoing cash flow that we receive from our assets. So there is almost no way we are going to be forced seller. And as I, as I mentioned, Volta is a listed vehicle. So as a manager of Volta, there is no redemption. So if people want to get in or get out from Volta, they are selling the shares, but there is no redemption for, for us. So there is, there is almost no way we are going to be for seller. 
And, and one way for us to benefit from the volatility is what I mentioned is that the, the cash flow that we receive from our asset has ve are very, very high. At the moment, our cash flow represents 14% of the NAV every year, of the net asset value. So meaning that every year we have 14% to reinvest, just considering the ongoing cash flow. And we have assets with mature, with which are re reimbursed every year as well. So if I look at the last 12 months, during the last 12 months, we reinvested 120 million from portfolio of 300 million. So the, 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 the duration of our investment is relatively short. The duration is only uh, 3.5 years. So meaning that in the coming years, we are going to have a lot of cash to reinvest. So that's really part of the strategy to consider assets which are either paying very strong cash flow, like, like CL equities, or investments which have a relatively short or mid-term maturity so that if we are right thinking that in two years time or three years time there is a bit of volatility and there is opportunity, we will be able to save these, uh, these opportunities. Can you just explain why the, the increase to CLO equity has been so um, significant over the last couple of years and what are the risks of that if, if we did go into a you know, wider spread environment and also what are the fees on the fund? So the, the fees, uh, AXA, we are paid 1.5% on the investment. So it's, 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 it's our fees, uh, which is basically reasonable when we compare to, to competitors. On, on the, the, the CLO equity, the, the idea is that we, we are investing in CLO equity and CLO debt for many, many years. We are doing that at AXA for 20 years and in Volta for the last 12 years. And at, at the moment, we think that Tomorrow, we will see more volatility on, on credit, on the loan side. Uh, and really, one way to benefit from this volatility is to invest in CL equity because the CL equity we invested in are the one that has been created a few months ago. So we have in, inside the CLO, there is five years of reinvestment period. So if in the coming five years, there is at some point some volatility in credit, those CL equity will benefit from the ability to reinvest during this period. So you, you have the possibility when you invest in CLO equity to perform better than the current yield of the portfolio, while when you invest in CLO debt, you are going to just receive your coupons. There is no way to perform better. And again, you, you saw that when I was uh, mentioning the, the, the performance by vintages, the CLO equity of the vintages 26 and 7, when we purchased them 12 years ago, we were expecting performance in the area of 12, 12 to 13%. And we ended up at AXA with uh, between 18, 18 and 21% performance. So all those positions perform better thanks to the crisis of 2008, 2009, which is, I know it's, uh, it will probably need more than two minutes to, to make you understanding all the details of that. But basically, the CL equity are able to benefit from volatility because it is an investment that is uh, managed and able to reinvest through time which is totally different from the other ABS, uh, RMBS, uh, or whatever instrument exists on structure finance. This one is very, very particular. What is your relationship with AXA? I, I keep seeing the name on there, but I don't see, you know, whether you're a subsidiary or, or what. You know, so I'm a bit confused. We are the investment company of AXA. So uh, AXA IM, AXA Investment Manager, is the, the investment manager of AXA. So we are managing 95% or 96% of, of AXA money. And of course, we are managing money for external clients. So AXA IM globally manages 7 750 billion. AXA Structure Finance, the department I, I, I work with, uh, manages 40 billion of structure finance assets. But we are a very large platform managing the money for, for AXA. Thank you, Serge. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I know Serge has uh, got a rush off soon uh, back to Paris, but, so he won't be around for the drinks, but thank you very much indeed. Okay, so the final uh, company to speak today is another investment company, and another uh, company that's aimed uh, at a high yield called Residential Secured Income, or RESI for short. It's a closed-end investment company, as I say. Investment objective of delivering secure income returns by investing in shared ownership and rental portfolios of homes. Current market cap's £160 million. Pounds. We've got Ben Fry, the fund manager, with us. Ben. Great. 
Okay, so Resi, what are we? We're an investment trust that invests in social housing. Um, I'll come on to explain what I mean by that in a moment. Um, we target a secure, long-dated dividend yield of 5% per annum, um, with intention to grow that in excess of inflation, which gives us a total return in excess of 8% per annum. There is some potential for upside on top of that as well, which I'll come on to explain a, a little bit later. Now, what are the key differentiators of Resi versus, um, versus other people in the market? Uh, first of all, we have a requirement that all of our investments must be able to support long-term investment-grade debt at our target leverage um, levels. This is a, a key limitation for us. We have, in building our portfolio of around 300 million, looked at about 3 billion of opportunities. Um, a lot of those that we have turned down have been because of this limitation. Um, so it, it is very important. Um, next is we have a subsidiary Resi Housing Limited, which is a for-profit registered provider of social housing. That means it is regulated by the housing regulator um, to provide social housing, which allows us to do two things. One is access government grant money to allow us to um, turn normal accommodation into social housing. Um, and second is to buy units that planning requires to be um, social housing as well. So you may have heard of section 106 units that are the 20 to 50% of units that are required to be affordable in a new development. So you have to be a registered provider to be able to acquire those units, which, which we are. The next differentiator is we're um, managed by um, the trade risk group. So trade risk itself has a long history in social housing. We've been active in the sector for the past 18 years, um, working as advisors to housing associations and local authorities, helping them with their funding needs. So we've combined the financial expertise of, of trade risks with a lot of housing expertise in our, um, in our management team. So in particular from uh, my colleagues, Pete Redman and Mark Rogers, who have previously managed large housing associations, um, Clarion and Notting Hill Housing, which between them own about 130,000 homes across, across the country, um, and they have 80 years of experience between the two of those. <coughs> so we have a great experience in this sector, which we believe is very important. Next is, um, I mentioned before that we invest in social housing. What do I mean by social housing? So we define that as, as three things. First and most importantly is below market rents. This is fundamentally the, the most important thing um, in this sector because accommodation should be affordable to people. Affordable means um, you're offering something that the market does not by itself. Next is our diverse income stream from economically insensitive tenants. Um, I'll explain that for, for each of our different investment classes. And third is we focus on strong counterparty covenants and managers. So we have tenants who are shared equity tenants by which they, they own a stake in the home that they're renting from us. Um, we let directly to local authorities who are generally AA rated entities. And then when we work with housing associations, we work with large credit worthy housing associations. So our two partners are Places for People Group who own or manage 198,000 homes and Metropolitan Thames Valley Housing, who own 57,000 homes in, in the southeast. So these are very large, established organisations. They've been around for at least 40 years. They know what they're doing very, very well. Um, OK, so that, that, porf that those requirements have led us to put together a portfolio of about 323 million across 2,400 properties, um, invested in three sectors, which I'll explain each of them individually to you. So the first is shared ownership, where roughly 77 million of our portfolio is. This is also the predominant focus of our deployment going forward. Um, next is local authority housing, which is the smallest with 36 million. And finally, uh, retirement rental, which is the largest uh, of 210 million. <clears throat> so I'll now explain what each of those three portfolios are individually. So first is shared ownership. So Shared ownership is an affordable home ownership product. The idea is um, individuals or couples buy a stake in the home and rent the remaining 75% from ourselves. Uh, 
that bit that I rent, they rented a below market rent, which is the affordable um, product that I mentioned earlier, the key being the below market rent. But for our perspective, it's a very good uh, ground, a uh, very strong rental stream for two reasons. So one, it's below market. Second, it functions like a, a ground rent. So if they don't pay the rent, they default on their ownership stake in the home, which gives us a lot of security. And then finally, that rental stream is growing contractually at RPI plus a half percent a year. Uh, so there is a lot of um, certainty in that cash flow as, as well as security. Now, I mentioned our portfolio is, is 77 million. Um, it is in two locations at the moment, so Clapham Park and Totteridge, both in London. Um, those areas both have um, huge housing affordability issues. So uh, house prices to average earnings in those locations are between 14 to 16 times. So you can see there's a huge gap between um, where people are able to get a mortgage for outright purchase and the actual house prices in, in those areas. So shared ownership becomes the only option for most of the population to be able to get on the housing ladder. If we look at some numbers there, I'm afraid I don't have these on the screen, but if you were looking at an average London flat of £500,000, in order to buy that on an outright purchase basis, you would need to uh, put down a £50,000 deposit and you'd be paying £30,000 per year on your mortgage. In comparison, you could buy that same flat on a shared ownership basis, uh, so £500,000. You'd only have to put down a deposit of £12,500 to buy your 25% stake. And then, importantly, your ongoing payments would be £20,000 per year, so two-thirds of what they are under the open market um, option. So you can see it's very affordable um, from two perspectives. One, getting a much lower deposit to enable people to get on the housing ladder quicker, and two, and equally as important, those lower ongoing payments. So in terms of some numbers around uh, shared ownership and, and what the returns are from those, um, it is a relatively low yielding asset reflecting the underlying security that you have, as I mentioned earlier. So the net rental yield on, on shared ownership is 3.4%. Is now the question becomes how do um, you get an asset that yields 3.4% and pay a 5% dividend out with that. So this comes down to uh, the long-term investment grade debt that I mentioned earlier. So we put in place on, on our shared ownership portfolio long-term, by which I mean 40 plus year maturity, um, RPI linked debt. Now, if you invest in government gilts, you'll know that um, RPI linked gilts trade at around kind of minus 2% now. Um, which means we're able to raise debt at a, around the real cost of about 0%. So if half your capital is coming from debt where you're paying 0%, that means that you can pay out a 6.5% return to the other half, which is your equity piece. Now that debt, as I mentioned, is RPI linked, which matches the, the underlying income stream being RPI linked as well. Um, so that enables us to get that 6.5% leverage yield, which, which gives us uh, our 5% dividend yield after costs. I mentioned there's an additional upside available on shared ownership. So this is what we call staircasing. So the idea of shared ownership is that people over time will buy bigger stakes in their home. Uh, this is an upside for us because when they do so, they do so at the then open market value, whereas we have bought these properties at a discount reflecting the lower rents that uh, are charged in the interim. So we like this asset class a lot because of that secure, long-dated RPI-linked income stream with upside to come from the uh, staircasing, as I, as I mentioned earlier, and hence it is our predominant focus going forward. Um, it does require that registered, regulated vehicle that I mentioned earlier, Resi Housing, to invest in this. So there are... Um, competitive advantages that, that we have here. Okay, our next um, area is retirement, uh, retirement housing. So this portfolio is age-restricted, but it's very much not to care. It is a very simple portfolio. Um, basically, these are flats within retirement blocks. So individuals will, um, will have a kitchen, lounge, bedroom, and bathroom but there will be shared uh, common facilities that they can also access. So a shared lounge, um, shared wash facilities, 
and also shared gardens. So people typically move into these flats um, because their partner has passed away. They want something that's more manageable. And also, most importantly, um, there is social interaction to address uh, loneliness, which is an increasing, um, population, uh, increasing problem for the elderly population. Um, so this portfolio itself, we are leasing to individual uh, retirees. What that means is that from an income perspective, our income is coming as rent is coming from their pensions, um, which may be topped up with pension credit or housing benefits um, in order to help them pay their rent. Importantly, the portfolio is rented out at what's called local housing allowance level, which is the level that you can receive um, pensions credit or housing benefits to should you require. So that means the portfolio is economically delinked. We don't require people to be in work um, in order to continue to live in, this, um, in these assets. Um, portfolio itself dominated in, in southern England in, in kind of retirement hotspots. Um, there's also about a quarter of the portfolio that is used to house um, the property managers of retirement blocks. So I mentioned ours are individual flats in those blocks. Those blocks will typically have 50 flats. Uh, we will rent five of them privately and the other 45 will be owner occupied. There's also a house manager living in those blocks and we rent the flats to them. That rental stream is even more secure for us because that comes from the service charge of all of those 50 leaseholders within the block. So it becomes a ground rent like RPI um, annually uplifting rental stream. As I mentioned earlier, this portfolio is managed for us by Places for People Group, and we've also done some uh, value additive uh, management exercises, which I'll explain when I talk about numbers a little bit later. Um, there are some numbers in terms of the economics of the portfolio in the top right. I won't go through them now, but we can come back onto those uh, later. Um, the third area that we invest in is our local, local authority housing portfolio. So what this is doing is leasing accommodation to local authorities to enable them to provide housing for people who are either homeless or um, at risk of homelessness in their borough. So local authorities do have a statutory obligation um, to house anyone threatened with homelessness in, in their borough. Now, you think of um, homelessness, you traditionally think of people living on the streets. Um, that's not the case. There's now 320,000 homeless people within England. A lot of those are working and they've been made homeless because they may have split up with their partner or more commonly, their landlord has decided to either increase their rent to a level that they can't afford or has decided to sell their flat. So local authorities have a huge problem housing these people. Um, their go-to solution is hotels, bed and breakfast, where they'll pay a huge amount of money. So what we do is rent accommodation to them at market rents. The local authority guarantees the voids and does the maintenance for us. Um, so for them, it is great because they're doing a real saving in terms of compared to that hotel's bed and breakfast. From ourselves, we're getting a very secure income stream, leased to the local authority for seven to nine years um, that, that is generally growing with inflation. Um, why do we only have seven to nine year leases? That's relatively short. Um, there is an explanation here. So the local authorities themselves can't do more than 10 years um, without receiving a lower amount of money from central government for housing these homeless people. So we work with local authorities who have huge needs and want to work with us in the long term, which is our portfolio in, in Luton specifically, but they can't because of the financials. Um, for us investing in this area, it is very important to invest in the right locations um, where there is huge demand for this type of accommodation for, for the long term. So hence, kind of metropolitan southeast, um, some of the devolved authorities, Manchester, Bristol, et cetera. Um, we've looked at a large amount of opportunities in this space that, that wouldn't work for us. The local authority may be able to give us a 10-year lease, but we can't get happy with the kind of 30-year view on that area. So for example, in, in Barnsley, we looked at a portfolio recently. Um, next slide, origination of registered provider. So I mentioned earlier that we have a a registered provider within the group, so a registered provider of social housing. It is regulated by the housing regulator that regulates all local authorities that provide housing and also all housing associations. 
So it regulates people who own about 4 million homes. Um, that regulator has a duty to protect uh, tenants' interests, but we believe that is very much in line with what we were looking to be doing as a responsible landlord anyway, investing for the long term. So we don't see any conflicts between our requirements under that regulation and our um, intentions to shareholders. As I mentioned, the registered provider does give us um, advantages. So it allows us to access that government grant money that we're using to subsidize shared ownership. We've drawn down six million already. Um, and it also allows us to buy those section 106 units that planning requires to be affordable. Um, in terms of our board of that entity, we do have independent directors who are there to represent tenants' interests and protect the regulatory part. Um, they're very well regarded. So one, Jill uh, Rowley, was formerly head of regulation at the regulator. And the second, David Orr, has just stepped down as um, chief executive of the National Housing Federation, which is the trade body for uh, housing associations. So these two people did a lot of due diligence before they joined us. So I, I think you should get in a lot of... Um, reassurance about that. In terms of our pipeline going forward, I mentioned earlier that it is very much focused on shared ownership um, because we see that as the most attractive of, of, of the asset classes we look at and the most attractive opportunity to invest in social housing. Um, we've built a portfolio, well, we've built a pipeline, sorry, of about 500 million at the moment of opportunities we could do this year um, if we had available capital. Um, and that reflects contractual arrangements like we have with Morgan Sindel um, and also strategic partners who we've worked with in the past. So the likes of Metropolitan Thames Valley Housing, who I mentioned before, who we bought our Clapham Park scheme off of, and Crest Nicholson, who we bought our, um, who we bought our Totteridge scheme off of. And we're working with a number of other house builders who see shared ownership as a great way to increase the amount of homes they're delivering because it doesn't compete with open market sale, so it allows them to deliver additionality in terms of their developments. So we're not just delivering additional affordable homes on the shared ownership, we're also delivering additional homes that wouldn't otherwise uh, be able to be built. Financial highlights, as, as I mentioned earlier. So Resi IPO'd in July 17. Since then, we have delivered a 14... Um, P 14% total return. So our net asset value is now um, 108p. So that's grown up. Uh, that's grown by 10% from 98p at issue. And we've also paid out um, around 5.5p as dividends. So that was 3p in year one, 5p in year two, which we're currently halfway through with the intention to grow that, as I mentioned, in excess of, of IPI of RPI going forwards. Um, that NAV growth, as I mentioned, we've done some value add in the portfolio. So in our retirement portfolio, we own those properties leasehold. We've extended those leases from about 70 years to 150 years. And we did it in a way that was um, additive to our cash flows, um, which I'm happy to explain a little bit later, but it, it, it's quite complex. <laughs> um, so, so that's the NAV piece. Um, we are also, as the fund manager, very aligned with shareholders. We own two and a half million shares, um, both directly and indirectly through, through our directors. Um, next is we've also done a share buyback program to uh, support the share price. So we were slightly late to deploy compared to um, our targets at IPO, which did lead to our share price declining last year. Um, we realized that uh, there was value to be having that for, for shareholders if we bought back those shares below NAV, and that that would also support the share price. So we bought back 9.3 million shares last year um, at an average price of 92.5p, which has added about half a pence uh, per share for other shareholders. Uh, next slide I want to talk a little bit about is social impact. Um, so this is very important for us. We are investing in, in social housing. Um, now, there's two ways of looking at social impact. The first and simplest is those below market rents that I mentioned. That's very easy to measure. So in our shared ownership portfolio, for each of those £500,000 flats that we deliver as shared ownership, 
that delivers a reduced rent with a present value of £86,000 to the shared owner. Um, so that's £14 million of value across our shared ownership portfolio in terms of reduced rents. Next is we're also delivering benefit in terms of for shared owners, people are knowing that they have their own home for life. They don't have to worry about potentially being kicked out in a year or two because their landlord decides to yank up the rent or their landlord decides to sell, as I mentioned earlier. Um, in the local authority housing, we're providing homes for people who would otherwise be either homeless or would be living in, in hotel bed and breakfast accommodation, which is pretty horrible, particularly for, for young families. And then in the retirement portfolio, as I mentioned, it's, it's particularly about supporting independence for longer, providing that uh, social interaction that people might not necessarily have access to, um, and also freeing up large family homes um, further down the house, housing ladder as well. So we give people a rental option to allow them to um, ha have different opportunities for, for what they can look at on a retirement basis. Um, next, I've got a quick slide that just gives an overview of, of the fund manager to, uh, trade risks. As I mentioned, we are long-term advisors to the sector. Um, you can see some pieces in here. Um, just to draw out a couple of facts. So first of all, the, the graph in the bottom left shows which of those large housing associations trade risks has worked with over the past five years. Um, so all those highlighted in, in yellow um, we've operated with. So that's about uh, what 75% of the top 20 housing associations. And then a lot of what we do is debt. So here, Trade Risk competes with the larger UK investment banks, um, and we do very well. Um, we're, we're number six in, in the league tables for, for bond issues and placements for housing associations. So the only ones bigger than us are the, the big UK uh, high street banks. Um, this slide is, is the key terms. I'm not going to go through this now. This is, this is more for your pack. Um, and then finally, just to kind of summarize everything we've kind of talked about before we come on to questions. Um, so we're about delivering a secure, long-dated um, inflation-linked dividend yield of 5p, growing that um, in excess of our of RPI, giving us our 8% um, per annum uh, target, with the potential to outperform that from staircasing, as I mentioned earlier. Um, in the, the 21 months since submission, we have delivered total shareholder return of 14p, so um, in excess of our target. Um, next is we do have a really secure income stream benefiting from, as I mentioned, below market rents, um, that diverse income stream from economically insensitive tenants, either because they're retired and paying their rent out of pensions or they're shared owners, so they have an ownership stake that they would lose if they defaulted, or we're letting direct to local authorities who not only have a statutory duty to house people, but have also very strong entities in their own rate in their own right, sorry. Um, and finally, we're working with very strong um, covenants and managers. So conversely to that, what are we not doing? We're not doing anything in, in the care sector. Um, why are we not working in the case se care sector? It doesn't really satisfy our test. So first of all, you have above market rents. Second, it's, it's very complicated to manage. And, and third, it, it wouldn't support long-term investment grade debt at our target leverage levels. So by long-term, remember, I'm talking kind of 25 to 60 years. So in our retirement portfolio, we use 25-year fixed rate debt. On our shared ownership portfolio, 40-year RPI-linked debt. And then finally, that social impact factor, which is, um, which is very important. So we focus on delivering additionality to social and affordable housing, as well as overall housing. So with that, I'll kind of move on to any questions. Here's the microphone. Oh, sorry. I note that your net debt seems to have risen by about 160 million for all the use of your current market, market, market capitalization over the last year. Is that something you can concern about? Yeah, so just to bring up this, uh, this slide, so we've got the numbers in front of us up in the top right there. 
Um, so our debt is currently 105 million. Um, that is 36% of our loan to value. It's below our target of 50. That will go up to 50 as we put in leverage on our remaining portfolio um, as we finish off our deployment of our IPO capital. Is it anything to be worried about? Um, no, and th there's two reasons. So first of all, that's supporting returns. And secondly, that is long-term debt that we're deliberately not exposing ourselves to the traditional risks of leverage. So the risks of leverage are, um, one, in the short term, you may have to pay it back, um, and you're either exposed to having to sell assets to do so, um, or to um, increased uh, interest rates when you do so. So we've removed that risk. And the second is um, exposure to, to covenant risk. So generally, our leverage uh, avoids uh, loan-to-value covenants, so it's about cash flow stability. As I mentioned, we're only investing in, in assets that have those very strong cash flows, so we have huge amounts of headroom in, in those covenants. Um, so the question was, um, what is our exposure to long-term um, maintenance? Um, are we putting those obligations onto tenants? And if we are, what recourse do we have to make sure that they are following um, or that they're keeping the property at the required standard? Um, so in terms of um, are we putting that onto tenants, first of all, for shared ownership, that is an obligation of the shared owners. Um, in the retirement portfolio, we, we manage that ourselves, but we have a, um, a very strong kind of 30, 40 year business plan that, that looks at those costs. Um, and then in the local authority space, that is uh, the responsibility of, of the local authority, typically. Um, how do we uh, monitor that and maintain that? So just going through each of those again. So shared ownership, these are typically flats. So the only responsibility the tenant has in terms of maintenance is to within their flat. So it's kitchen, bathroom primarily, carpets, decoration, um, which is relatively simple um, if, if that goes wrong. We, we do have recourse uh, to their stake if it does. The actual building fabric is controlled through the service charge um, and through by the freeholder themselves. Um, in terms of the local authorities, we have dilapidation clauses in the leases. So if they don't maintain the, um, the accommodation to the standard, we can um, collect that money off them at the, at the end of the lease. Actually provides an incentive for the local authority to renew the lease. Um, but importantly, we are monitoring this co constantly. So our, um, our, our property team are visiting these properties probably every two weeks in terms of the local authority housing. Um, to ensure that we're working well with the local authority to provide a uh, great accommodation for our tenants. And did you say you had a second question as well? Yeah, it was, it was a kind of curiosity. You, you mentioned below market rents. What is a below market rent? I mean, is it a percentage below what you commercially let the property out at? And is it adjusted for the shared ownership, presumably the... They own 25%, so it's 25% below market rate anyway. Yes, yeah, so um, on the shared ownership, what does that mean? So we charge a rent only on the 75%, and we charge a rent that's set on day one at a maximum of 2.75% of the open market value. So that's a government requirement, um, which is pretty much below the London average of around 4%. Um, so that is a, that is a requirement. Now, over time, our rent grows with, with RPI, so there is, there is a potential for that to um, move out in, in terms of market, but that is a contractual position. Um, so that's what that means. So, so it is broadly 30% uh, discount in, in London. You mentioned the staircase in, uh, in shared yeah. ownership. What kind of proportion is currently owned outright by the tenants, and what proportion is owned by you. Um, how do you see this going forward? Is there, um, are a lot of people opting to staircase up? And how would this actually affect your business model? Do you see this as a, something favorable if more people uh, opt to buy larger portions of their flat? So, I mean, it's a, as, as I see it, it's a balancing act between a capital gain and long-term rental income. So. How do you see this affecting your business model? Yeah, so there's a, a couple of questions within there. So first of all, 
um, is in terms of what are typical staircasing rates. Um, so there are now 200,000 shared ownership properties um, within England. Shared ownership's been going for about 40 years. Um, typically, those rates vary between 1% to 8% per annum. So we assume a long-term rate in our models are, of 2% um, per annum. Um, why does it vary? Well, conversely to what you'd expect, staircasing rates end up being high when house prices are high, low when house prices are low, reflecting the fact that when they're higher, people are more confident, um, and so they may be able to buy bigger stakes in the property, or more likely, they're more likely to move home at that point, and so staircase direct from their 25% stake on, on day one up to 100% at that time. Um, in terms of the ownership stakes that people typically have, in London that is typically 25% on day one. Um, across the rest of the country, it is probably a 35% average. So outside London, it is, it is closer towards 50%. Um, just reflects house price earnings as, as a multiple, sorry, house prices as a multiple of, of earnings in, in those areas. In terms of what do we prefer, staircasing or not staircasing, I think it would be great if we could just sit on the asset forever and collect the RPI linked rent. Um, that isn't going to happen because ultimately people will buy bigger stakes over time. Um, that does obviously give us a profit, but we have to reinvest that, that profit in that time or, or ultimately repay the cash to shareholders if we can't. So it's good to have a nice balance between the two. As I mentioned, in terms of our returns, they're all targeted just based on the rent. So for us paying our 5p dividend, we don't need any staircasing to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, ben, thank you very much for that. A couple of notices. So um, I encourage you to fill in the feedback form uh, in your pack and leave them with us. Please either leave them on your seats or, or give them to us. We'll be sending you copies of these uh, presentations and of the... Uh, of the video in the next coming days. Um, for those of you who are professional investors, uh, remember we can issue a CPD certificate to you for um, uh, three and a half hours CPD time. Please, um, I think there's a form to fill in for that afterwards. Uh, our next forum is uh, going to be in September. There'll be further details to follow. Uh, and it just leaves me to say thank you very much for attending. Uh, there are drinks and canapes in the adjoining room. A chance for you to talk to the management. Uh, of the uh, of the four companies that are presented thank you again thank you very much indeed